Welcome to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Our listener support campaign continues. You can become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month by going to patreon.greatdetectives.net. And I want to go ahead and thank our latest Patreon supporter, Pam, supporting the podcast at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Pam. And to help us find the best possible sponsors to our podcast, please fill out our advertising survey, adsurvey.greatdetectives.net, by Monday, March 11th. Now it's time to get into this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial. Now, as usual, we will be playing the first two episodes today and then the final three episodes on Friday. If you want to listen to all five episodes at once, go ahead and press pause and then come back on Friday to listen to the complete serial. But now from October 8th and October 9th, 1956, here is the Primrose Matter episodes one and two. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Brad Taylor, Johnny, Mid-States Industrial. Oh, hiya, Brad. Caught another chief accountant with his hand in the till? Nope, this is an old case, Johnny. Three weeks old, anyway. It's that Kansas City payroll stick-up. Uh-huh. We were right. It was the Jipper Nitsen gang. How do you figure? Well, as you know, there's been an APB out on him, wanted for questioning ever since he disappeared the day after the holdup. Yeah, I know, Brad. He was recognized last night in Phoenix, Arizona. State Highway Police threw up roadblocks. They tagged him south of Tucson, just north of the Mexican border. They get him? If they had, I wouldn't be calling you. He shot his way clear, but they killed one of his boys, Ronnie Bledsoe. He'll never be missed. So Jipper's still on the loose, huh? Yep, along with that $100,000 payroll insured by us. I gotta get that money back, Johnny. All right, Brad. I'll fly out there and find it for you. Uh, but watch yourself. Every minute, those hoods are three-time killers. I thought it was two. Three now. They killed a state trooper at that roadblock. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Mid-States Industrial Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Primrose matter. Item one, $142.80, incidentals in Hartford and transportation to Tucson, Arizona, where I checked into a hotel. Then I contacted the highway police and presented my credentials to Lieutenant Cal Mervin, who was directing the all-out search for the Nitsen gang. Lieutenant Mervin had been at the roadblock. They call us flat-footed, Dollar. That's how they happen to get away with it. How do you mean, Lieutenant? We flashed the red light on them, and they slowed down and rolled up to us like they were going to stop. The car was a different make from the one they'd supposedly been seen in. We found later they'd stolen another one in Phoenix. I see. Then when we threw the spot on them, we saw just the one man, the driver. Turned out the others were down on the floor. How many were in the car? Four, apparently. Three afterward. I shot one of them. They threw his body out a half mile down the road. I may have hit another one. I'm not sure. That figures. I tip off from Kansas City named Jipper, Nitson, Ronnie Bledsoe, and two unidentified. Yeah, and Bledsoe's the one who was killed. Nitson and the other two got through. You said they slowed down as though they were going to stop. What happened? Oh, there's no excuse, Mr. Dollar. We were careless, that's all. Why don't you get so many false alarms, mistaken IDs? And to make a car, the whole setup, it didn't seem to fit. You can't be wound up ready to pitch all the time. Well, we paid for it, then with his life. I was luckier. I got off with this bullet burn on the side of my head. Hey, you never know. Checked. 
Well, anyway, the boys on the floor of the car came up shooting. One of them with a Tommy gun. And they used the Tommy gun in the stick-up. That's how the two guards in the armored truck were killed. It's a rough weapon, Mr. Dollar. Ben dropped on the first burst from it. Didn't even know what hit him. I got this scratch from a pistol bullet. Saved my life, I guess. It flattened me before the Tommy gun picked me up. Then the driver slammed into second, and they skidded past on the shoulder. I hauled up my gun and emptied it at him before I passed out. Hitting that fellow Bledsoe was sure luck. Any trace of them at all since they broke clear? No. They had a little luck themselves. As I said, I passed out, and it was 20 minutes before a car came along the highway. Or before one stopped, anyway. I think several probably passed, scared to get mixed up in something. Oh, that's understandable. Then the fellow that picked me up took me 15 miles up the road to an emergency first aid station. All in all, it was over an hour before the report got to highway patrol headquarters and they could get new blocks set up. And Nitson and his boys could have covered a lot of ground by then. Sure, that's it. Here's a map of the southern Arizona area from here to the border. Mm -hmm. Here's where they hit us. We had the roadblock there at the junction. I see. From there south to the border, there's no through road branching off, just some dead enders. Or like the Arivaca Road that loop back and connect into the highway again. What about the border, Lieutenant? According to the Mexican customs officials at Nogales, the car didn't show up there. And I'm inclined to buy that. With the rear window shot full of bullet holes, it would have been pretty conspicuous. And as I understand it, it hasn't turned up anywhere else. Nope, so far we haven't been able to find it. Of course, they had the advantage of an hour's head start. Well, that's it, Mr. Dollar. They could have doubled back. It could be in New Mexico, northern Arizona, California, a thousand places. On the other hand, though, they couldn't have known they'd have that hour's start. What do you mean? Well, they couldn't have known they'd killed your partner and left you unconscious. You were still shooting at them when they gunned away from that roadblock. All they could reasonably suppose was that you'd be reporting in by radio two minutes later. What are you getting at, Mr. Dollar? Well, if that's what they did suppose, then they wouldn't try any doubling back. And yet they didn't reach the border down here at Nogales. But there's no through road that connects into that 20-mile stretch of highway. All right, so maybe they're still bottled up right in that section. I don't see how. We've been over it half a dozen times. In cars, horseback, helicopter, we're still checking it. I'm just about ready to cross it off. Well, logic says that's the most probable place they'd be. Can logic find them, Mr. Dollar? It might, combined with a whole lot of luck. You got something in mind? Well, I don't know. I, I was wondering if a civilian, so to speak, might have a better chance of stumbling onto them. They'd be on the lookout for the official search parties. You being a civilian. Uh, that's what I sort of had in mind. They're pretty rough lads. Hey, tell me something. Do you get a lot of rock hounds around here, uh, amateur geologists, uranium hunters? <laughs> if you're not careful, they jump out from behind the cactus and stake a claim on your watch dial. Easterners, some of them, I suppose. Uh, tenderfeet, I guess you'd call them. Not some of them, most of them. Then one more wouldn't exactly create a sensation. No, he wouldn't even be noticed. Is that the angle you're thinking of? Unless you know a better one. No, it's not bad. Well, do you know where I can get fixed up with an outfit? Go to Dave Bright's Sporting Goods on South Stone Avenue. He'll give you that dude look about as cheap as anybody. Just tell him I sent you. All right. And um, don't get too far away from civilization, Mr. Dollar. Any special reason? Yeah. I may want to contact you to let you know the Nitson gang's been picked up in Portland or in Butte, Montana. Maybe. But I wouldn't count on it. Expense account item two, $446.35 for a deluxe rockhound rig, complete from buckskin field boots to sleeping bag, snake bite serum, and a Geiger counter and including five days' rental on a four-wheel drive Jeep. With that kind of a get-up, anybody'd have to find uranium just to break even. But at least I figured I was equipped for any possible eventuality, so I headed into the wilds. And the first spot I decided to prospect was around 20 miles north of the border, 50 yards back off the highway. It was known to the local inhabitants as Jake's Bar and Grill. The bar was a warped plank counter with rickety wooden stools. The grill seemed to consist of a rack of stale sandwiches wrapped in wax paper. But it looked as though Jake himself might be paid dirt. Uh, howdy, stranger. What do you say? Save your money and buy beer. <laughs> That's a good idea, but I think I'll have a scotch this time. Even better idea. <laughs> uh, have something yourself? Uh, uh, you paying for it? Yeah, I might at that. Well, then I'll just have me a little of this foreign hooch. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well... Here's biting the rattlesnake. Check. 
Scotch. <coughs> well, you figuring to find yourself some of that there uh, uranium, are you? Yeah, I might. How'd you guess? Them duds you're wearing come from Dave Bright's place. Sunday mining clothes, we call them. Hey, no offense. Oh, I'm hard to offend. The name's Johnny Dollar, Mr. Uh... Jake Meager. Jake's enough, though. Everybody knows him for that. Been around here a long time. Oh, then you know this country pretty well, I imagine. Well, enough to tell you that if you find a fresh square foot, one where somebody ain't already been looking, then you're doing better than most tender feet. No, uh, no, no offense there. It's just a way of talking. Well, I, I guess you'd call this a vacation, too. I, I don't really care much whether I find anything or not. It's uh, just a chance to see some new country. Well, I reckon you could call some of this more or less new. Once you get away from that there highway. Oh, and how do you go about doing that? You mean by car, I guess. Uh, Easterners ain't much on walking. Well, I, I have one with a four-wheel drive. It'll get you a mile or two further, but that's about all. Only way to do it's on foot. <laughs> You're probably right. But I'd start by car, at least. <laughs> uh, which side road would I take if I wanted to get lost? Uh, around here, you mean? Yeah. Anywhere along the highway between the junction and the border. Well, as a matter of fact, you wouldn't have much choice. There are six, seven passable roads, but they don't lead no place except to ranches. Don't even get up in the foothills. You, uh, you ain't getting a mite dry again, are you? Mm. Oh, sure. Funnel both up again. Well, <laughs> much obliged to you, Mr. Dollar. No, my son. Yeah. Well, there'll always be an England, like the fellow says. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Oh, yeah, about them roads. Now, <coughs> the only one that might fit the bill for you is uh, Santa Rita Summit Road. <coughs> oh, I think I remember that on the map. Yeah, on the map. Well, it uh, it leaves a highway about three miles down and runs 14 miles back up into the Santa Rita Mountain Range. It doesn't connect on through? No, dead ends, a couple of miles past Primrose Camp. None of these here roads go no place. That's what I've been telling them state police for two days. They've been looking for some stick-up fellas. Be... I reckon you heard about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Why, them fellas would be out of their minds to take one of them there side roads. Ain't no place they could go to on them. Oh, it sounds logical, all right. You ask me. Them fellas jumped the border somehow. That's how come they was down here in this part of the country to begin with. Oh, you're probably right, Jake. Anyhow, uh, you think this summit road might get me off the beaten path, huh? Well, it's your best bet around here. It climbs up into the pines. Uh, it hits 6,000 feet at Primrose Camp. It's in good shape, too. Used to haul ore out over it a few years back. There are mines up in there? No, no, no. They're all worked out now. Oh, few little high graders scratching for pennies. But the big stuff's gone, for the time being, at least. Some folks figure it'll come back, but I ain't one of them. Well, what is this Primrose Camp? Pop Mardell's place, named after the old Primrose Mine. Yeah, but what is it? Well, mixture of things. Why, uh, Pop's probably been making more money there than he would if the mines did come back. He, he, he's he got a filling station and half a dozen flimsy tourist cabins, lunch counter that his missus runs, little grocery store and souvenir shop his daughter Jenny takes care of. Oh, got a lot of things making income for him. Oh, what about customers with a place 14 miles up a dead-end road? Well, he gets a few. Enough. Picnickers and tourists in the summertime, hunters in winter, oh. and fellows like you all year round <laughs> come looking for this uranium stuff. He ain't got much expense, neither. It's all in the family, you see. And he, now he's got a new hand to help, starting today. That's so? Yeah, yeah. He come down this afternoon and get the mail. Yeah, you see, the bus stops and drops it off here with me, and Pop comes down every day and picks it up. Hey, I figure he likes a chance to get out of the sight of the missus for an hour. <laughs> 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 Sent this boy today. Uh, this new hand he's taken on. Well, uh, not exactly a hand. He's Pop's nephew, so he said. Comes out of Tulsa yesterday. Oh, I see. Funny thing, though. He sure didn't have any Oklahoma accent. Uh, Jake, how old a boy is he? Well, hard to say. Between 25 and 30, maybe. A real close mouth sort of fella. Couldn't hardly get a word out of him. Uh-huh. Uh, nothing at all like Pop. Why, that old fella talk a leg off you if you go up there. Before you can open your mouth, he'll sell you a tank of gas, two quarts of oil you don't need, some genuine phony ore samples, and rent you a couple of them cabins of his. And... <laughs> well, thanks for the warning, Jake. I'll be ready for it. Well, uh, good luck, Mr. Dollar. Uh, whatever it is, you're uh, hunting. What do you mean? I've seen a lot of tenderfeet come hunting uranium, but you're the first one that wore a shoulder holster with a gun in it. Uh, uh, no offense, you understand. <laughs> Jake.
Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Cal Mervin, Mr. Dollar, State Highway Police. They relayed your call to me. Good. I was just checking in, Lieutenant. You said to keep in touch in case I left civilization. Well, you haven't left it far. I recognize the number. Oh? You're at Jake's Bar and Grill on the Nogales Highway. Yep. You didn't need a uranium hunter's outfit to go prospecting in that little nugget. Well, I'm going up into the Santa Rita Mountains around Primrose Camp. You're playing a hunch or have you got a lead? Well, both. But at the moment, it's more hunch than lead. I just wanted you to know where to start looking in case I disappear. Now, look, Mr. Dollar, I've got every man on the force out now looking for that gang of killers and the $100,000 payroll they stole. If I have to add you to the list, that's about all I'll need. Relax, Lieutenant. If things work out, you may find us together. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Jake's Bar and Grill somewhere on a highway in southern Arizona. To the home office, Mid-States Industrial Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Primrose Matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item four, three dollars and sixty cents to Jake Meager for information and incidental beverages. The Chipper Nitson gang had hijacked an armored truck in Kansas City and escaped with a $100,000 payroll. Two nights ago, they'd shot their way through a roadblock in southern Arizona, killed a state trooper, and left one of their own members dead in the road. Then the other three had simply disappeared. The information from Jake? That old Pomp Bardell operated a tourist camp and service station 14 miles up a dead-end road in the nearby mountains. And it seems that Pop had acquired a new nephew within the last 24 hours, a complete stranger to Jake. There was only one way to check it out. Drive up to Primrose Camp. Howdy. Hi, how are you? Uh, want me to fill up the tank? Yeah, I might as well. Uh, probably won't take much, though. Hey, how much farther does the road go? Just a couple of miles. Oh, too bad. I was just starting to enjoy the scenery. Hey, you know, you're lucky living up here in the hills. Got some real pretty country around you here. Yeah. I thought I might spend a little time in it if I could find a place to stay. I guess there'll be some more tourist cabins on down the road. No, huh? no, these are the only ones. Oh, oh, well. Well, in that case, you got yourself a border. Huh? Took less than four gallons. Yeah, I figured it wasn't that much. Hate to get caught short, though, up here away from the highway. Now, uh, about that cabin. Oh, sorry, we're all full up. Huh? You, you'll, you'll find some places down on the highway. Well, there uh, wouldn't be much point in that. I was planning to do some prospecting, get around a little on foot. This would be a good spot to work from. I, I, I've got no vacancies. How about the oil and water? Oh, yeah, you better take a look, I guess. Bad country for a tenderfoot. You get in a lot of trouble. Such as what? Uh, snake bite, get lost, fall off a cliff, a lot of things. <laughs> oh, I've been in a place or two before. Uh, best you forget it, son. Oil's all right. It's funny, those cabins look empty, no cars parked in front of they're, them. They're all rented. And the water's all right, too. Well, who are they rented to? Vacationers? Prospectors? They couldn't say. That'll be a dollar twenty-six. All right. Hardly worth stopping for. There you are. Keep the chance. Thanks. Call again. Yeah, yeah, maybe I will. When Pop Bardell gets back. I'm Pop Bardell. You can't be. You don't fit the description. What do you mean? Well, I was told Pop Bardell had start talking a leg off me before I even got my mouth open. That he'd not only sell me a tank of gas, but also two quarts of oil I didn't really need and a handful of fake ore samples and... Rent me a couple of cabins whether I was planning to stay or not. Who, who told you that? Jake Meager down at the highway. Uh, Jake. Jake's one talks too much. Maybe. Jake had not a said... Uh, who, who, what is it? Uh, nephew? You about through out there? I need a hand in here. Yeah, yeah, I'm all through. Oh, that the nephew Jake was telling me about? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's him. Oh, nice looking fella. Arrived yesterday unexpectedly, Jake tells me. Yeah, 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 that's, that's right. Comes from Tulsa, I understand. Tulsa? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, from Tulsa. Uncle! I'm coming! Well, now, I got just, some just... friends in Tulsa. I wonder if he might know. Where are you going? I want to say hello to your nephew. No, you can't go in there. Why not? 
We're, we're fumigating it. It just ain't safe. Oh, oh, all right. I won't go inside. But I want some cigarettes out of the machine. I'll get them for you. Just give me the quarter. You feel all right? Sure. Well, it seems to me you're kind of jumpy on edge. I thought all you Westerners were supposed to be relaxed and easy going. Now, look, you, you want them cigarettes. You just have give... trouble, Uncle? No. No, no trouble. This fella just wants some cigarettes is all. What brand? Chesterize. There you are. Thanks. Oh, here, don't you want the money for him? You give it to my uncle here. Yeah, sure, here you go. Thank you. If that's all now... Say, uh, I understand you're from Tulsa. That's so? Well, I got a good friend down there, Clem Welke. Uh, thought maybe you know him. Afraid not. Look, if there's nothing else now, you Been just... there about a year. He's working on that new electric plant they're building down there. But I guess he'll be out of a job before long, though. Understand they'll have the plant done by the end of the month. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's about finished. Now, look, mister... Surprise you... you never met, Clem. But Tulsa's a big town. Yeah, it's a big town. Come on, Uncle, let's get that stuff moved. Well, I guess I'll drift on down the road and sleep out tonight, maybe. I got my sleeping bag. Oh, probably see on my way back, I guess. Yeah, you do that. There was only one thing wrong with the whole setup. To the best of my knowledge, there wasn't any new electric plant in Tulsa. I drove on past Primrose Camp two miles farther to the end of the road. It was narrow, unpaved, and for the most part bound by a straight drop-off on one side and a vertical cliff on the other, with no chance for a car to turn off. There were two fire roads for access by the Forest Service, actually nothing more than narrow trails. The turnoffs were blocked by steel cables padlocked between heavy metal posts. As far as I could tell, they hadn't been tampered with, and no car had turned into either of the trails for a month or more. It added up to one thing. There was simply no place in the area where the Nitsen gang's car could be hidden. Yet I was still certain that they were here, somewhere. An hour later, I'd left my car at the road and was lying on a rocky ridge 300 yards or so above Primrose Camp, watching the place through binoculars and seeing nothing of any importance. Two cars stopped. Sightseers, apparently. One driver had the water checked and left. A couple got out of the other car and spent 20 minutes in the lunchroom, came out and drove off. Pop Bardell came outside occasionally, his wife too, a couple of times. But Bardell's daughter, whom Jake Meager had told me about, didn't show. Neither did the mysterious nephew. I kept on watching. Howdy, stranger. Hmm? Hunting something now, yeah? Oh, uh, no, no, not exactly. You look like you was. I'm <laughs> just admiring the view. A city fellow, ain't you? Guess you can tell one every time, can't you? Kid, when you lived alone in the mountains, as long as I have, then them duds you're wearing, too. Got them at Dave Bright's store, didn't you? That's right. The Dave outfits a lot of you Eastern fellas can always tell stuff that comes from Dave's. It's got a look about it. Hey, uh, you wouldn't be a prospector, would you? Forty years of it, son. You... Live up in these parts somewhere? A six mile across the canyons there. Got a cabin I built myself and some claims of mine. Ain't been there for three weeks, though. Oh, is that so? No, been prospecting over toward the Rincons. Heading back home now. You're the first living soul I've seen. You haven't heard any news, then, in the last three weeks? No. Nope. Oh, my name's Johnny Dollar, by the way. Jed Marsh, proud to know you, son. Howdy. Sized you up before I spoke to you and decided to take a chance. Mighty glad uh, to find you ain't a smart aleck like a lot of them city fellas. Oh, it takes all kinds to make a city, Mr. Marsh. I reckon so. Never could see why it takes some kind, so. Hmm. There's Pop Bardell out in front of the station. Usually step by and say howdy to him, but I reckon I'm going to pass it this time. Known Pop long? About 14 years now. Well, then you must know his family pretty well. Well, aside from his missus, there ain't no family except their daughter, Jenny. No, I was thinking of his nephew in Tulsa. He ain't got no nephew, Mr. Tala. Oh? What's did he have? He ain't got no living kin at all, except for some cousins in Virginia. Oh, uh, I guess I was misinformed. Yep, that's for sure. Pop's a real lone wolf. Used to be a prospect himself years back, but he never really had the knack for it. Anyhow, he, he finally bought this here Primrose camp and settled down to a civilized way of living. I'd say he got about as far away from civilization as he could. A compromiser, that's what he is. Always fooling himself. I told him that a lot of times. 
even keeps on prospecting off and on right around the camp there when he knows there ain't no pay dirt on this rock. <laughs> well, that's like a city man growing vegetables in a window box, I guess. Son, I wonder if I can ask a favor of you. Well, sure, what? I was aiming to go on down there and get Pop to do it, but I'll have to stay all evening if I do, and I'm kind of hankering to get home. Well, if it's anything I And of I can... course, if I go to the authorities... They'll keep me around asking questions, making statements. What are you talking about? If there'd been any signs of life, anything I could do to help, you understand? Mr. Marsh, what are you getting at? Well, over across the ridge there, in the bottom of the canyon, there's a car half buried under a rock slide. Right easy, Mr. Marsh. We don't want to start the rest of that rock coming down. I've been moving rock all my life, son. Here we go. All right, it's clear. Let her go. Good. Now, that's good. I can get the car door open now. Watch this. Yeah, yeah. They had it pretty well buried, all right. Well, who do you mean by they, Mr. Uh, Dollar? It doesn't matter at the moment. Give me a hand, will you? Let's get this guy out. That's fine. We'll lay him here on the side of the car. It's like I figured... Couldn't be anybody left alive after rolling all the way down that slope. This one wasn't alive before the car rolled down. What? He was shot by the state highway police. Mr. Dollar. They did a good job of hiding the car, temporarily at least. It couldn't have been seen from the air. The only way of finding it was to stumble onto it the way you did. You ain't up here just for pleasure, are you, Mr. Dollar? I'm an insurance investigator. I'm after a stick-up gang who've killed two bank guards and a state highway trooper. This man was one of the gang. There ain't nobody else in the car here. Is he the gang? There were four of them to start with. This is the second one who's been shot to death. There are still two to go. Where you figure they are? At Primrose Camp. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a lion's den reluctantly opens its door to let a trusting victim step inside. And the victim? Me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, so far this episode, Johnny's been having some good hunches. I will say the line of questioning of the quote-unquote nephew was interesting. I think he was pressing his luck a little bit because if he's right and he's dealing with a desperate criminal, uh, he could have violence on him in a second. Even if the nephew had been legit, he could have risked arousing his suspicion with the nosiness. Of course, it's silly to expect someone from Tulsa to know someone else or even to ask that 
given that by this time it was a city of 250,000 people. Of course, people do ask silly things like that. When I first moved to Idaho from northwest Montana, people would ask if I knew other people they knew in eastern Montana, about 400 miles away, so maybe it wasn't too much of a stretch. Now, quick note, we only have three more weeks of the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar serials left. After that, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar will continue to feature on Friday in standalone episodes, as it has since we first started the podcast. On Tuesday, we'll be featuring some previously uncirculated episodes of programs we played before, and then we'll be getting into Bulldog Drummond, but that will be a few weeks off. All right, well, listener comments and feedback, and we received plenty of comments regarding the Meg's Palace matter, and we start with Julie. And she writes, oh my word, Virginia Gregg's character in these episodes is priceless. She is so amazing. Definitely a great, great performance from Virginia Gregg. And then uh, over on Facebook, Francis had a couple of comments first on the first two episodes. This is a great story with wonderful acting from all concerned. Meg's fight with her boyfriend must have been a tiring scene for the sound effects man. I had not thought of that, Francis, but I think you're right, and I would love if there had been a film made of that. Because there are films that were made showing sound effects men at work, but... This would definitely have been a fun one to watch. And then uh, Francis wrote on Friday, this is one of my favorite Johnny Dollar plots. Great plot and even better performances. And then Joanne writes also on Facebook, love Johnny Dollar. And then I got a really interesting email from Eddie who writes, Byron Cade promises Johnny Dollar to double his expense account if he doesn't get a full day of fishing during the investigations. Johnny's uh, total is 22160. Shouldn't it be 44320? Although that doesn't seem enough for the beatings he took. Eddie, this is a fair point. I do think that writing these serials, that sometimes the writers, particularly Jack Johnstone, will lose track of these sort of little details that they put in the story, and so it's laid down but never followed up on. Although, to be fair to Jack Johnstone, considering the format of this, it could be a challenge dramatically to pay this off. Because it was mentioned at the start of the serial on Monday, and your 1956 listener is listening to it on Friday. So, most likely, they don't remember it. And the only way they would have is if Johnny kept bringing it up then if he brings it up at the end, people are like, oh, well, what, what's this even about? I don't remember this. I guess that's the writing production perspective on it. Yeah, if you want an in-universe view of it, you could take the view that Byron said he was going to double Johnny's expense account. He didn't tell Johnny to do it. So Johnny could know Byron so well that he just you know, sends in an expense account for the right amount, and Byron's going to make the adjustment on his end. He doesn't have to bring it up again. The other explanation is that filling this out before he returns to Hartford, he has been knocked around so much that he doesn't even remember the promise of the doubled expense account. Which, given the sort of beatings he took, I I could believe. I don't think it would be something that would be forgotten forever, but Byron could be getting a call in three weeks. That job you had me on, the Meg's Palace matter, I just remembered that you promised to double my expense account if I didn't get to go fishing. And with all the beatings, I didn't feel much like going fishing. So whichever you would prefer, I guess, you can... You, the plot line is resolved that way. And then we also uh, received an interesting question, this one from Ken, asking over on our website at greatdetectives.net, I've been listening to some of the older episodes of your podcast, and I heard you talking about how the fat man reminded you of Barry Craig in tone and stories. A question occurred. Do you find much difference 
in the shows recorded in New York versus the ones in Hollywood. I really enjoy your podcast. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate the question, Ken. I do find that there are differences between New York and Hollywood programs of a certain era. And of course, here we have to generalize a bit. Because when we're talking about New York-based programs, we're talking about everything from Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, the Casey Crime Photographer, Fat Man, Nick Carter, Master Detective, The Thin Man. So that's a lot of territory, and you can't say that something is true of every series there. The same is true for every series in Hollywood. Now, one of the big differences is obviously personnel. If you're listening to... If you're listening to a Hollywood radio program and they have a guest star, it's likely to be someone who worked in film. They might be a veteran star or they might be an up-and-comer. They might even be someone whose career never really took off, but they thought they might take off, which is how they landed the guest starring role. There's going to be a whole lot less from New York because you're going to be dealing with stars of stage and Broadway. One thing I really liked about Dr. Joe Webb's wonderful blog on Casey Crime Photographer, which we relied upon so much when we were playing it, is he went into all of the New York papers and he got details as to who some of these guest stars were. And in many cases, they were veteran performers with great reputations who had done some really fantastic things, and you could really appreciate it. One thing I don't like about shows from New York that don't credit their guest cast, like Philo Vance or Boston Blackie, is that you don't really know who some of these people were. You can tell that they're not part of like the typical radio stock of guest actors, but you don't know who they are, and even someone who was more into history wouldn't have any idea as to what their significance might be. So you might be listening to the program and think, this person sounds like they might be of some significance, but I have no idea who they are or what that significance might be. So that's one aspect. It's minor, but it it is something that's different about New York. New York radio programs, I think, tend to have more of an element of melodrama, which can actually have an appeal to me, depending on what it is. You will tend to see more characters who live by these very unique sorts of codes or ways of living as part of their overall approach, ideas of honor and dishonor, in subtle or varied forms, tend to work their way in. You have all sorts of little subtle emotional dynamics and things that blow up in characters showing they have hearts of gold. And then, of course, you have the sort of situations you get from Hummer programs like Inspector Thorne or Mr. Chameleon or Mr. Keen. These sort of things are a lot more common coming from the New York. And that perhaps leads into the biggest difference in that Hollywood radio programs tend to be a bit less theatrical. New York radio programs, again, of a certain era, tended to feature actors giving much bigger, broader performances. And a lot of that goes to the influence of the stage on New York actors versus Hollywood and the movies. And one thing that I've observed with movies is that a lot of films, early talkies, and feature some really large theatrical, yeah, we would say over-the-top performances. As the 30s progress, performances stop being so big. And I think there was a realization in Hollywood that films called for a more subtle type of acting. And that ends up reflecting in radio. And I think it's even more true of radio. Film doesn't require the same level of scale to a performance because on stage you're really wanting to communicate to an entire audience. Many of these actors go far back before you could 
artificially increase the volume. So you really had to sell it, and it had to be a very big performance. With film, that's just way too much most of the time, and so it got dialed back. And over radio, radio may be the most intimate medium. It's just the listener and the program. I think it's even more so because we tend to go around with headphones and we're just sitting there with whatever we're listening to. And we don't need it to be big, boisterous, over the top. Which I think is why some of the New York radio doesn't agree with a lot of audiences. For example, Carl Swenson's performance as Mr. Chameleon would work great if you were going to a dinner theater where they had a mystery and you could just hear him shouting and bellowing. But it's not quite the same thing if you're putting this on right before bed. It can be enjoyable, you know, if you're in the mood for it. Big Finish, who I've mentioned, you know, quite a few times in the context of their Doctor Who releases, did an original mystery series, Shilling and Sixpence Investigate, starring Celia Emery and the late, great David Warner. And it was adapted from a live dinner show that this troupe of actors did around the country. And the performances are really big and boisterous, and they've got a lot of accents and dialects in there, even though it's produced as an audio drama. But it's definitely not going to be for everyone. And of course, you hear this in the fact that, well, I, in my experience with New York-based old-time radio, you continued with a lot of the more ethnic dialects being prominent than you heard in most Hollywood shows. Again, there are exceptions. Life with Luigi came from Hollywood, obviously. But they tended to do that in there, and of course you had other little things that spoke of theatrical approaches. You know, like on Boston Blackie and Philo Vance, they would have these thugs, but they would have a distinguishing characteristic. Usually a verbal tick. A lot of people don't appreciate that, even though you are actually doing more work as a New York radio writer in giving these characters these unique verbal ticks, as opposed to Hollywood, which essentially wrote all the thugs, all the bosses, completely interchangeably. I mean, most of these characters from the Hollywood programs were completely interchangeable. Like, how many of the Toffs in Pat Novak for Hire or, or Richard Diamond even were characters that you would remember. But I will always remember the guy from Philo Vance who tolerated no mistakes and said that over and over and over and over and over and over again. I do think that this difference between Hollywood and New York began to ebb over time. Some of this was a change in how stage acting was done. And also, when it comes to crime programs, Dragnet had a really strong impact in challenging programs to be more realistic. So by the time you get to the middle to late 50s, a lot of these things that say, in the immediate post-war era, were really distinct and that New York acting tended to do, had pretty much gone by the wayside. You still had Mr. Keene kind of hanging around and making a comeback even as late as 1955. You'd have these little bits of melodrama that would come through in some performances, but I think w once you get later into the 1950s, it's really hard to see much of a difference between New York and Hollywood at all. Thank you so much for the question. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Stephanie. Stephanie has been one of our Patreon supporters since March of 2020, currently supporting the program at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Stephanie. 
And that will do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you're enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. All those great things that help YouTube channels to grow. As I said, we will be back on Friday with the conclusion of this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial. But join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... Gar is going to receive a package by the end of the week. A necklace. And there at the bottom of the page is a rough sketch of the necklace with instructions how it is to be broken down. Have you received a report of its being stolen? Uh, No, no. But we sent a description of the necklace to all the leading jewelry firms in Europe. Uh, Two hours ago, we received a reply from the house of Fijac in Paris. And they've identified the bracelet? Yes, yes. It belongs to the Countess Navarre. She by any chance staying in Nice at present? That is correct. She has a villa there. You know, Inspector, it's possible that necklace hasn't been stolen yet. Quite. We have been informed there is to be a gala reception at the villa tonight. And, of course, the Countess will wear her necklace. Look, could you arrange for me to get an invite to this little soiree, Inspector? I will arrange everything, Monsieur. But uh, a word of caution. If your attention is distracted but for a moment... Yeah, I might miss the play entirely and our friend might get away. Look... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.